What I'm going to talk about today is evidence-based psychosocial and combined treatments for ADHD in children and adolescents. I want to start with disclosures. In the ADHD field, it's important to tell what relationships one has with pharmaceutical companies. Even though I'm talking about psychosocial treatment today, I will talk a little bit about combined treatment. And I have had relationships with pharmaceutical companies for uh, quite a while. We helped develop uh, Concerta along with Jim Swanson. Worked with Abbott on Silert, uh, worked with Shire on Adderall, Adderall XR, with Novin on the Detrona patch, and many other clinical trials. I've always thought of ADHD as the most important uh, child mental health disorder. Um, I know that my internalizing colleagues think of it as only one of the most important uh, child mental health disorders, but it certainly has uh, at least a very high prevalence rate and high impact on the individuals and the families with whom uh, affect, that are affected by ADHD and uh, a huge impact on most professionals who end up interacting with children with mental health problems. The prevalence rate in the U.S. is 2 to 9 percent of the population, depending on the study, depending on what you read. 3 to 5 percent is a number that people throw around commonly. And that prevalence is uh, similar across many countries, as some recent cross-cultural studies have shown. Uh, children with ADHD are dealt with by healthcare professionals, mental health professionals, allied health professionals, educators, just about everyone who works with children. It's the most common behavioral referral to healthcare professionals. So in pediatric offices, for example, about a third of all pediatric visits are for behavioral problems, not for physical problems, and half of those are for ADHD. It's the most common referral or diagnosis in special education. It's not the most common reason that children get included in special education, but if you go to a school district and, uh, and apply DSM diagnostic criteria to all children in special ed, you typically find that half the children in special ed carry a diagnosis of ADHD. It's the most common behavior problem in regular classroom settings and the most common diagnosis in child mental health facilities. So it's a common problem dealt with by all professionals dealing with child mental health. In addition to professionals, uh, ADHD is all over the media and something that families have to deal with. To illustrate that, I show you this uh, cover from a very popular children's book, Captain Underpants and the Perilous Plot of Professor Poopy Pants. These are terrific books. If, if you have, uh, you're at Barnes and Nobles over the holidays uh, shopping and you have a chance to go to the kids section and sit down in the children's section uh, to read some books, I pick up a couple of these. You can read them in about, uh, in about 20 minutes. And, uh, and they're written at the level of both children and adults. So these books are all about the boys in the lower corner there, George and Harold, and George and Harold are the troublemakers in their elementary school. In this, uh, in this book, the fourth epic book in the series, it starts with this paragraph. All the experts at Jerome Horowitz Elementary School had their opinions about George and Harold. Their guidance counselor, misdirected, thought the boys suffered from ADD, the school psychologist, Ms. Labeler diagnosed them with ADHD, and the mean old principal, Mr. Krupp, thought they were just plain old BAD. By the way, in this, the guy in the cape in, on the, the cover of the book is Mr. Krupp, the principal, because George and Harold uh, bought a magic ring on the internet and hypnotized the principal such that whenever they were sent to the principal's office, they gave him a post-hypnotic suggestion that whenever they snapped their fingers, he would take his clothes off, tie a cape around his neck, and fly out the window and go superhero deeds, do superhero deeds. So from that point on, when they got sent to the principal's office, they would walk in snapping their fingers, and he would fly out, they would take his clothes off and fly out the window, and they would get off scot-free. The reason I show you this is that this is not a book written about ADHD. It's a common children's series, but for this part of the, uh, for this book in the series, the author decided to make the subjects ADHD. It's something that even kids deal with, not just parents, and, uh, and children read about in the literature. ADHD has been around for a long time. When I went to graduate school very many years ago, uh, ADHD had been studied about 10 years or 15 years even then. We've always thought of ADHD as, as uh, <clears throat> comprising three core symptoms or resulting from three core symptoms, inattention, impulsivity and hyperactivity. And these have been constant for the past 50 years, even though the names have changed. So starting with the 30s and 40s, people talked about brain damage in children and the minimal brain damage in children and the minimal brain dysfunction, 
hyperkinetic impulse disorder going through the 50s, and then hyperkinetic reaction of childhood in DSM-2, attention deficit disorder in 1980 in DSM-3, and ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder with DSM-3R, DSM-4, and presumably DSM-5. So the names have changed, but the core symptoms have always remained the same, inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. The current definition defines ADHD based on whether a child has a sufficient number of symptoms of inattention, and this is the DSM list of inattention symptoms, hyperactivity, impulsivity symptoms, this is the DSM list of those two. A child can meet criteria by having only a sufficient number of inattention symptoms or a sufficient number of hyperactivity, impulsivity symptoms, or both. He can be inattentive type, hyperactive, impulsive type, or combined type. A key point to keep in mind is that the definition of ADHD uh, does not require only the presence of a sufficient number of symptoms. It also requires impairment, problems in daily life functioning. It requires impairment across settings. It requires impairment in symptoms at an early age, before the age of seven. And there must be clearly significant evidence of clinical impairment in order to make the diagnosis. The domains of impairment that the children exhibit are wide-ranging and cover almost all of their activities in daily life. Relationships with parents, teachers, and other adults, relationships with peers and siblings, academic achievement, behavioral functioning in school, family functioning at home, even leisure activities. Many years ago, we did uh, studies looking at ADHD children in baseball games and, and found out that ADHD children's attention when they're in the field in baseball games is worse than their attention when they're in uh, classroom settings in elementary school. So their problems occur even in leisure activities. The reason I, I showed this slide and emphasize, want to emphasize uh, functional impairment is that functional impairment is really the central problem in ADHD. Children who have ADHD don't get referred to mental health services because their mothers are sitting around at night reading the DSM, wondering if their children might have a DSM disorder, because the children get, uh, the parents get called by the teacher. The teacher complains about the child's behavior at school, or the parents get contacted by a neighbor who's complaining about the child's behavior around the neighborhood. It's these problems in daily life functioning that are what uh, bring a child bring a child's problems to a parent's attention and then cause a parent to go seek help. It's why children are referred for treatment. There also is, is a, a good 40 to 50 years of research showing that problems in daily life functioning like this are what drive, what mediate long-term outcomes for children, not just with ADHD but with a number of other mental health disorders. The key domains of those are peer relationships, problems in peer relationships, problems in parenting and the family, and academic achievement and behavior problems at school. Because these variables, more so than the symptoms of ADHD, are what drive long-term outcome, this is what we should focus on in treatment. That's an important thing to keep in mind as I go through the talk today, because many studies of ADHD, particularly in the pharmacological literature, are, are emphasize assessing whether or not the DSM symptoms have improved with treatment as opposed to whether or not uh, problems in daily life functioning have improved with treatment. So the most important thing to keep in mind in assessment is assessment of impairment in daily life functioning. Initial, initial, initial evaluation to see what the problems are in daily life functioning, the ongoing assessment to evaluate treatment response. And our goal of treatment is not to eliminate the DSM symptoms of ADHD, not to eliminate symptoms of inattention, impulsivity, and overactivity, but to, to eliminate or minimize the impact of those symptoms on problems in daily life functioning. So the driver is always going to be problems in daily life functioning. That's what we're gonna focus on in treatment. That's what we want to make better in the child in whatever way we are able. In addition, it's not just minimizing those problems, but it's maximizing adaptive skills and functioning if those are necessary to, to uh, help minimize the problem and achieve normalization or, or normalization of uh, problems and impairment. Why is it important to treat ADHD in childhood? Years ago, people used to think it wasn't important at all. Not that many years ago, 20 years ago, 
Uh, 25 years ago, many people argued that ADHD was a benign problem and all children would outgrow it, which was a lot of the justification for the early use of stimulant medication with ADHD kids and why it became so widespread. People thought that if you just medicated a child while he had these symptoms, by the time he was a teenager, he would outgrow it. Now we know that's not the case, and it is important to treat ADHD for a variety of reasons. One of the main reasons is that uh, it's now widely recognized that ADHD is a chronic disorder. It is not the case that ADHD kids grow out of the disorder. When they move into adolescence and adulthood, they have a host of problems that are arguably more severe than the problems that they had when they were in childhood. I made this slide as a summary of what the literature seems to show about outcomes of ADHD children. If you look across the studies of outcome, across the studies of adolescent and adult outcome for ADHD, you can generally say that about a third of ADHD children have a tolerable outcome. The slide used to say good outcome, but I changed it uh, several years back because I don't think it's a good outcome. It's a tolerable outcome, which means the children have learned how to adapt and how to cope, but they still have difficulties as they move into their adolescent and adult years. They have to consistently work to adapt to their difficulties. About a third of kids have moderately poor outcomes. They continue to have a variety of moderate to serious problems, including school problems and adolescence and problems in the workplace as adults, interpersonal problems across adolescence and adulthood, uh, general problems perhaps with overuse of alcohol, and general underachievement uh, throughout the, the domains of their lives. And then about a third of the children have what we would consider a pretty bad outcome. That is serious problems in psychopathology, uh, including criminal activity, uh, sociopathy, incarceration, serious problems with drug use, a whole host of bad uh, difficulties that, uh, uh, that are very costly for, their, for the individual, for their families, and for society. If you look at the societal cost of ADHD, it's enormous. This is a paper that uh, Jess Robb and Mike Foster and I did a number of years ago for the AAP where we looked at the societal cost of childhood and adolescent ADHD in North America. When you add up the numbers, uh, doing a traditional uh, cost of illness approach to analyze the cost, you end up with about $40 billion, $42.5 billion, with a range from 36 to 52 as an estimate of the annual cost of ADHD in North America in 2005 dollars. To get a sense of how big this is, consider the cost of other uh, major public health problems in America, the cost of Major depressive disorders, about $44 billion, less than the cost of childhood ADHD. The cost of stroke in America is $53 billion, again, about the same as childhood ADHD. The cost of Alzheimer's is $100 billion. If you add the estimated cost of adult ADHD to the estimated cost of child and adolescent, you get a number that's almost the same as Alzheimer's, which everyone recognizes as a huge public health problem, but we don't tend to think of ADHD as a public health problem, but it is. So given that the outcomes for the children in the absence of effective treatment are not good and the societal cost of ADHD, what is effective evidence-based treatment for ADHD in childhood and adolescence? And what I'm going to focus on today is evidence-based psychosocial treatment and then a little bit about combining psychosocial with medication when psychosocial is insufficient. These are the most common but not evidence-based treatments that are uh, used with ADHD children in the U.S. The top three are probably the most common interventions employed in mental health settings. Traditional one-to-one -one therapy or counseling, cognitive therapy, office-based play therapy. For all of these treatments, there is no evidence that they're effective, even though they're commonly used uh, throughout North America and, and throughout much of the world. Dietary interventions with ADHD are commonly used also, even though there's not good evidence that those are effective interventions with children. Biofeedback is being increasingly commonly used, even though there's limited evidence that it's effective. Allergy treatments, chiropractics, perceptual and motor training, sensory integration training, balance problems, pet therapy. The Today Show had an episode several years ago where uh, Katie Couric was on the Today Show and she brought in somebody who said they could cure ADHD with pet therapy. I gave a talk in Israel uh, five or six years ago, and a lady in the audience got up when I said the only thing that worked was behavior modification 
and she said horse therapy worked for ADHD. So people have, have lots of ideas about what works. There's not good evidence for anything except uh, behavioral intervention and for medication. And I list uh, number 12 here, duct tape, as uh, only part of, partially a joke. Uh, you remember the teacher that was arrested in Missouri several years ago for duct taping an ADHD child to his desk in the classroom and duct taping his mouth closed. And that did not have a good outcome for either the child or the teacher. So what does work? If these are the commonly used treatments, but the ones that have no evidence base, the treatment literature is really clear that there are only two things that work. Three, if you put those two together. Stimulant medication, behavioral interventions, and the combination of the two. And this is true uh, whether one does meta-analyses of the literature or you look at expert uh, consensus in, uh, in professional associations. So for example, <clears throat> the AAP practice guidelines for treatment of school-aged ADHD children, which came out in 2001 and then just came out again uh, in late 2011, concluded that for elementary age children, primary care clinicians should recommend either FDA-approved medication and or behavior therapy, preferably both, to improve target outcomes in children with ADHD. So they recommended behavioral interventions with the same strength that they recommended medication, and they recommended combining the two as preferable. For children under six, the American Academy of Pediatrics actually recommended that behavior therapy should be the first-line treatment. That medication should not be employed as the first-line treatment for children under six, with medication perhaps as an ancillary used judiciously considering its risks and side effects. For adolescents, the AP concluded that medication should be prescribed with behavior therapy as ancillary. Uh, I'll talk about this, uh, we'll talk about the evidence for this uh, during the talk today, but this is what the AAP says about treatments for ADHD. So again, they say that medication is effective, behavior therapy is effective, and the combination is effective. Given that we have two treatment modalities that work, medication and psychosocial treatments, an important question is which one should be used as the first-line treatment. And again, I'm talking about psychosocial treatments today, but I want to spend just a moment talking about, uh, I will spend just a moment talking about medication as the justification for why psychosocial treatments uh, arguably should be used as the first-line treatment. Now, what kind of evidence is there that anything should be used as first-line treatment? So the AAP guidelines that I just showed you a slide of uh, didn't say whether you should do medication or behavior modification first, or you should do the combination at the very beginning. They just said use medication or behavior modification or the combination. So they don't give any guidance in terms of what sequence one should use to do the treatment. The American Psychological Association had a task force in 2007 that said the first treatment one should use is psychosocial treatment because the, the, uh, the effects, the impacts and benefits of psychosocial treatment and pharmacological treatment are roughly comparable and the risks of psychosocial treatments are less than the risk of pharmacological treatments. So in a risk-benefit trade-off, you say psychosocial treatments first. The guidelines of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psych Psychiatry say the opposite. They say medication should be first-line treatment, psychosocial treatment should be second. Around the world, in Japan, the pediatric guidelines say psychosocial treatment should be first, medication second. The British guidelines say for mild to moderate cases, it should be psychosocial treatment first, and medication added uh, after that, medication for more severe kids. And then the, uh, the largest parent advocacy organization in the country, CHAD, says that both should be used simultaneously. So there are lots of different opinions among uh, professional, uh, professional associations about which treatments should be used first, even though everybody agrees that both work. The reason this is an important uh, issue to discuss is because of the dramatic increase in the use of medication over the last 20 years. This slide simply shows the increase in the use of both U.S. and global volume of uh, medications, uh, stimulant medications for ADHD between 1993 and 2003. This slide shows that continued for 2004, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So there's been a dramatic increase in the use of medications in the United States for the treatment of ADHD over the past uh, 20 years. There's not been a corresponding increase in the use of psychosocial treatments for ADHD. There's an interesting paper that just came out a couple of months ago uh, talking about that in general 
for treatment for mental health problems, that the use of pharmaco uh, pharmacology has, has uh, outpaced the, the growth in the use of psychosocial treatments across the board, and it's especially true for ADHD. What are the components of effective uh, treatment for ADHD? I said that behavioral treatment works. Behavioral treatment works. When we say behavioral treatment, what are we talking about? We're talking about behavioral parent training. We're talking about classroom-based interventions for ADHD and interventions for the children directly. And then we're talking about medication as an adjunctive intervention to psychosocial treatments if they're insufficient. Why is it important to include parent training and treatment for ADHD? First of all, no one is taught how to be a parent. In, in America, one does not have to have a license to become a parent. One needs a license to do almost anything else in the country or in education, but one can be a parent uh, simply by having adequately functioning biological equipment and meeting somebody else with adequately functioning biological equipment. You can produce a child and you don't have to know anything about how to raise that child. That's a terrible state of affairs, uh, the result of which is that we have lots of children with problems and parents who do not know how to deal with them very well. If you end up being one of those parents and you have a child who has ADHD, you really have a handful, a handful and uh, you need to really learn how to be a parent. Parents of ADHD kids have significant stress and psychopathology. They have poor parenting skills. There are lots of studies that show that, uh, that ADHD children contribute to their parents' stress, and that contribution to the parents' stress can result in parental problems worsening. For example, parental alcohol problems, parental depression, parental anger control problems, and those parental problems can feed back into maladaptive parenting which then worsens the child behavior problem and you get a vicious cycle in families where the parents and the children are both having difficulties that exacerbate the other. And we know for, we've known for years that the characteristics of parenting that are associated with bad outcomes in developmental psychology in general are the same characteristics that ADHD children's parents show in their parenting skills. So it's very important to emphasize parenting as one of the first-line interventions, if not the first-line intervention for children with ADHD. What are we talking about with parent training? We're talking about uh, good, good old behavioral parent training, which has been around for 40 years and used with children with disruptive behavior disorders for that time period, starting back uh, 40 years ago at the University of Oregon with seminal groundbreaking work and uh, expanding to lots of places around the country that do very good, have done very good work developing behavioral parent training programs that now are widely disseminated uh, throughout North America. What do we mean by behavioral parent training? It's focusing on teaching parents skills, teaching parents how to deal with the children's behavior in the home setting, and how to improve their relationships with their children and with other family members. Parents learn skills and implement treatment with the child and are taught to modify the interventions as necessary using an ongoing functional analytic approach. Parent training can either be individual with one set of parents and one therapist, or it can be group-based. Unfortunately, the literature shows that group-based parent training is as effective as individual-based parent training, and it's much less costly for mental health centers to implement. So group-based parent training is a good way to start. Typically, parent training sessions are set up almost like courses, where parents come in for 8 to 12 to 15 sessions, depending on the parenting program that one is using, and they learn uh, learn the skills and the techniques that, uh, that are known to be effective parenting techniques for use with ADHD children. It's important to, to understand that, uh, to have parents understand that parent training doesn't produce instant changes. You have to train the parents who then have to go home and implement what they've been taught with the children and then the children have to learn from their interactions with the parents how to change their behavior. So parent training involves learning at two levels. Parents learning skills and parents transmitting those skills to their children, their children learning changes in behavior based on the way their parents interact with them. That doesn't happen instantly. That's one of the, uh, the problems, I think, with the relative use of behavioral interventions in medication is that medication produces instant changes and parent training is much more difficult to implement and produces slower, more gradual changes in the children. We've known for, um, probably a good 15 years that one course of parent training is insufficient to sustain an impact in a child with a disruptive behavior disorder 
over the long run. So there's lots of, been lots of research over the last few years, uh, in the last decade or so, and how to continue support with parent training, how to provide booster sessions, for example, how to do things that will keep the parents involved in implementing the intervention for long periods of time. And just as in other areas of uh, psychology, dealing with relapse prevention, which would be backsliding in the part of parents, is an important uh, component of what, uh, what should be done in parent, behavioral parent training with ADHD children. In addition, there are whopping differences in the nature of parent-child relationships as children move from the preschool years to the elementary years and then as they move again from the elementary years to the adolescent years. And the nature of uh, what parents need to do, as well as the parent-teen uh, relationship, for example, change dramatically from the, uh, the previous developmental stage. So establishing programs to get parents back involved in interventions as children make major developmental changes is very important. That's not something that's been done regularly in the field yet, but it's important. It's also important to know that, that uh, parent training is not something that can only be offered by someone with a PhD in clinical psychology. The parent training programs that are available can be purchased by any mental health professional, by people who are who are not mental health professionals, um, and they can be read and implemented effectively by a wide range of uh, professionals and lay people. We should keep that in mind because there's no reason that parent training can't be offered in schools, in churches, in community centers, in primary care settings, as well as in uh, direct care mental health settings. And again, there are many studies documenting the benefits of behavioral parent training. Of the 175 studies of uh, effective behavioral treatment for ADHD. Most of them involve parent training, and there are another 200 studies of parent training in children with disruptive behavior problems that include ADHD but are focused on conduct disorder or aggression. So a huge literature showing that parent training is effective in the short-term intervention of ADHD. Why is it important to use behavioral treatments for ADHD in school settings as well as for parents? The American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines say a school intervention plan should always be a part of the intervention that's planned for children with ADHD. So not just parent training, but a school-based intervention. It's important because, as we all know, ADHD children have a host of problems in school settings. I'm not going to review these uh, because you have the slides to, to, uh, uh, to look at, but what they show is that ADHD have a whole variety of problems in classroom settings from simple disciplinary problems that occur frequently in school, to dropping out of school, having low grades, being held back, receiving special education, and so forth. Uh, these behaviors are, are what contribute to the enormous cost of ADHD in the educational sphere. So because of this, we need to focus on school interventions as well as interventions in the home. Now this slide, which summarizes what's important about school-based interventions is very similar to the slide and what's important about parent-based interventions. The reason is they're both based on the principles of social learning theory and a functional behavioral analytic approach to working with the children. So you start with a behavioral approach. You don't work directly with the child. Instead, you train the school personnel who work with the child to change their behaviors and to change their practices. They then have to work with the child and the child has to learn to change their own behavior based on uh, what the teacher and the classroom aide and other people in school have done in terms of their own behavior change. So just as, uh, uh, just as with parent training, the changes that one gets are not instant. Learning is required both on the part of the staff who are trained as well as the uh, children. The focus is typically on classroom behavior, academic performance, and peer relationships in most school-based interventions. They're widely available in schools. I've heard people say that, that, that uh, behavior modification isn't widely used in school settings. My experience has been that it's, I've never seen a school that didn't use behavioral interventions in the classroom. My own children's schools use behavioral interventions. Every teacher they had all the way through school had classroom rules and consequences for following the classroom rules or not following the classroom rules. There's considerable variability and the uh, fidelity with which teachers implement the things that they try, the behavioral things that they try, but they're widely used in school settings, and teachers are often, uh, are typically quite receptive to implementing behavioral interventions with children with disruptive problems in classroom settings. The way typical teacher training is typically done in a clinical setting, in a mental health setting, 
is either by telephone or by direct visit to help a teacher set up to talk to a teacher, observe the classroom, and then give the teacher tips on modifying what their practices are in the classroom to facilitate the ADHD child's improved performance in the classroom. I'm going to go ahead to the next slide, then I'll go back to this one. Uh, what's highlighted in yellow here says daily report card. This is a picture of a daily report card packet, a daily report card uh, that can be used by teachers and parents in school settings. Basically, the teacher has identified a list of target behaviors that are a child's particular problems in school. They're ideographic target behaviors, individualized for each child. The teacher picks levels of, or goals that she wants the child to reach that are attainable, attainable goals, and then evaluates those throughout the course of the day and gives the child feedback. The child then takes the data report card home to his or her parents, and parents provide a reward or a positive consequence at home for having achieved uh, a good daily report card, having met their goals that day in school. This is the most common intervention that's been used in school-based interventions for children with ADHD. The first study on it was published in 1966. Very widely used program and very effective. So a daily report card should be a part of the behavioral intervention for every ADHD child who has problems in school settings, which is arguably every ADHD child. Teachers are very receptive to it. In the multi-site treatment study, for example, the MTA study, which was conducted in seven sites throughout North America, only a handful of teachers out of the nearly 300 teachers involved in the psychosocial treatment wouldn't implement a daily report card. So back to this slide. Again, the slide is very similar to the other, uh, the other slide. You have to do continued support and contact for as long as necessary. There's no reason to believe that if a teacher in the third grade sets up a data report card and, uh, and that's effective in changing an ADHD child's behavior in her classroom, that if the next year's teacher doesn't do something similar, that the child will not have uh, the same kinds of problems. So one needs to set up school-based interventions so that it's not just the individual child's teacher who's being uh, worked with, but the guidance counselors, the school psychologist, other staff at the same time so that all the ADHD children in the school are getting effective interventions and so teachers don't have to be taught individually each time they get a new ADHD child what to do. In-service training is a common way to provide that sort, that kind of intervention in school settings. And again, reestablishing contact for your ADHD clients based on uh, major developmental transitions is important. When children, ADHD children get to middle school, and then again when they make the jump to high school, daily report cards are not used very often. They have to be changed dramatically in order to fit with the way middle schools function and the way high schools function and teachers' uh, willingness to cooperate with interventions for children with ADHD. So things change dramatically when you move from elementary school to middle school and to high school. And as I will uh, repeat later in the talk, the number of studies on school-based interventions for ADHD teenagers is far less than the number of studies for ADHD uh, elementary age children. In fact, of those 175 studies that were cited in, in the slide earlier, probably no more than 15 of them are done with teenagers and with young children. All the rest are done with elementary age children. So we have much more literature on, uh, on elementary age children and effective treatment, psychosocial treatment for ADHD than we do with young children and with teenagers. So why it is important to use behavioral treatments to target the ADHD children's problems in peer relationships? Well, I already mentioned that peer problems are one of the major drivers of long-term outcomes for ADHD, and ADHD children have serious problems with peers. In the majority of them, uh, they have particularly negative relationships with peers, and as I said, this is one of the best drivers of long-term outcome. So if you look at what peers say about ADHD children, this is from a study, an old study, where all the children in the school filled out classroom sociometrics and rated each other on a variety of behaviors. And then we later went back and, and, uh, and figured out who had ADHD and who didn't, and then could evaluate the peer perceptions of the children with ADHD. The numbers there are the percentage of classmates who say that the statement is true of the ADHD boy versus the control boy, for example. So try to get other people into trouble, play the clown and get others to laugh, tell other children what to do, being bossy, being chosen last to joining group activities and starting a fight over nothing. 
are nominated are are um, uh, are indicated two to three times more often for children with ADHD than they are for controls. It's very clear from a whole variety of studies of direct observations of ADHD children, including uh, extending uh, these studies of peer uh, sociometric ratings uh, and teacher ratings, that ADHD children have serious problems in this domain. And many people believe this is the main driver of outcome and should be one of the major foci of treatment. It also is the hardest area to change. It's much easier to teach parents and get parents involved in parent training and to teach teachers to do classroom management than it is to get ADHD children's peer perceptions and uh, peer-related behaviors changed. One of the reasons for that is the limitations of working on peer problems in a traditional clinic setting. So what should one do for child-focused interventions dealing with peer relationships? Again, this slide has some elements that are the same as the slide for parent training and for school-based interventions but there are several differences. One is that uh, parents are not focused on in this slide. There's been very little work showing that parents can be taught effectively to create changes in a child's peer relationships. There are a couple of studies that have tried to look at that, and maybe a, a hint that it might be helpful to get parents involved in these interventions, but parents alone cannot make major changes in their child's peer relationship. In addition, you look at the highlight in yellow, it's very clear that traditional clinic-based social skills training, that is having ADHD children come in once a week for eight weeks to 10 weeks to a clinic and be taught how to be friendly, nice, and fun towards other children is not going to have an impact on their relationships with other children, particularly their uh, negative nominations on classroom sociometrics and their behavior in classroom settings. So traditional clinic-based social skills training, which is unfortunately probably the most common form of social skills training used in the country, is not effective with ADHD. What appears to be, to have promised to be more effective are much more intensive programs. So intensive programs in school settings, like some of the programs that are used with children with conduct problems and aggression, and those involve sessions devoted towards children in combination with uh, sessions devoted towards teachers, after school programs, weekend programs where a child comes in as in, and is involved in intensive peer relationship training while parents are also getting taught how to, to implement parenting skills. And then intensive summer-based programs where kids can actually go, ADHD kids can go to a camp that's focused on teaching them how to get along better with other children. These more intensive programs uh, show much better evidence of effectiveness than do traditional clinic-based programs, but they're much more complicated to do. They cost more than, uh, than traditional parent training and, uh, and they, require, uh, um, uh, they require natural environment settings. So you can't do them in clinic settings. You need to be in settings like schools and community settings where you can implement these treatments. Just as with the others, the other uh, parent and uh, teacher interventions, you don't expect instant changes because, again, the children have to learn the skills that are being taught in, parent, in these programs, and then they have to change their own behavior over time. As with the others, you have to continue to do uh, peer-based interventions over a long period of time and plan for maintenance and relapse prevention. And that means uh, getting school systems involved in implementing programs that, be done, that can be done at the school-wide level, for example, for ADHD children. So I already showed you this slide. This is to say, okay, we have good evidence that behavioral intervention works. What is the evidence in terms of how large the effects are and what kinds of behaviors are changed? You look across the, the, the behavioral treatments that have been used for children with ADHD. There's an excellent meta-analysis done by Greg Fabiano and published in Clinical Psych Review in 2009 that shows that the effect sizes are uh, moderate to large across all the studies and across all the different measures and across all the settings that are evaluated. Behavioral treatment improves functioning at home. Parent training improves compliance uh, with parents' uh, commands and requests, improves parent, ra parent ratings of children's functioning in the home setting. Behavioral interventions in school improve classroom disruptive behavior, improve rule following, improve teacher ratings of children's behavior, and in peer settings, 
there are improved positive and negative interactions. That is, improve, increase positive and reduce negative interactions with children. So lots of studies have shown these kinds of changes in children with ADHD. In addition, the evidence is there for the benefit throughout the entire age range from childhood through adolescence. As I mentioned earlier, there are fewer studies with children and adolescents, but the outcomes of the few studies that there are are similar to what we find with elementary age children. The benefits are generally independent of comorbidity. That's important to understand because ADHD children have high rates of comorbidity. Depending on the study, one can typically find that two-thirds to three-quarters of ADHD children have a concurrent oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder, but it doesn't make any difference whether they do in terms of their response to behavioral treatment. It's just as effective for children with severe conduct problems as it is for children without conduct problems. At the same time, there's room for improvement even after acute clinic level treatment for many children. So if one is doing uh, the kind of intervention that can be done in a clinic setting, many ADHD children are improved with parent training and improved with a simple school-based daily report card intervention, but still have room for additional improvement. We'll talk about what to do in a few minutes uh, if you have room for improvement. And a point to make is that uh, there is less evidence, there are very few studies for long-term benefits than there is for short-term benefits. Lots of evidence for short-term benefits, less evidence for long-term benefits because there are very few studies uh, that have examined that. And there's very little evidence on how to maintain benefits from the short run into the long run and thus a recent emphasis on a chronic care model on how to develop interventions that can be implemented consistently over a long period of time in a community and a home settings. This is from Fabiano's meta-analysis review. Basically what this shows is that across all the types of dependent measures and all of the study designs that have been used for the 175 studies, there are large effect, moderate to large effect sizes for uh, everything that's been evaluated in terms of ADHD functioning and uh, response to behavioral treatments. And circled in red at the very bottom, 0.74, was the, uh, the effect size weighted for uh, group size in the studies. And that's a good, uh, almost a large effect size, a large moderate effect size, which shows that, AD, that behavioral treatment interventions are very effective across a wide range of measures and a wide range of settings for children with ADHD. To give an example of that, consider the, um, one of the studies reporting on the parent training effects in the multi-site treatment study, one of the largest treatment studies that's been done with ADHD in the field. What this slide shows is that uh, the behavioral treatment, kids who got behavioral treatment and combined treatment, combined treatment is both medication and behavioral treatment, showed more improvement from uh, the beginning of treatment baseline to 14 months and then maintained that improvement in terms of parent negative and ineffective discipline. So this was observations of parent discipline in direct parent-child observations, uh, discipline types, and parent ratings. And, uh, and the parent training that the children received resulted in a better performance than the control group. As an illustration of what behavioral treatments can do in school settings, consider this slide, which is from a study Greg Fabiano reported in the School Psych Review in 2007. What this shows is, uh, for the purposes of this, uh, of looking at this slide right now, is that the three lines, the blue line, the red line, and the black line represent three levels of behavioral treatment in children in a summer treatment program study. The blue line represents children in the classroom in the summer program without any behavioral intervention. The red line is children who are getting a clinical level of behavioral intervention. And the black line is children who are getting very intensive behavioral intervention with a point system, with intensive feedback, and rewards on the part of staff and uh, parents. And in the far left column shows the effects of the different behavioral interventions on days when the children were not taking medication, um, the placebo days. So you can see that there's a huge effect from an average of 60 rule violations per 30 minutes that's 60 rule violations per child per 30 minutes in the classroom settings without any treatment at all to 15 or so with the low intensity treatment and then eight or so with the uh, full-fledged intensive behavioral treatment. So what this shows is that behavioral treatment implemented in the classroom setting with children with ADHD has a giant effect. 
and the effect is comparable to the effect of a substantial dose of medication. And I'll go back to the slide when we talk about medication in a while because the blue line to the far right shows the effect of 0.6 milligrams per kilogram of medication. And as you can see, that data point is actually higher than the data points for the two behavioral interventions. So behavioral intervention in the classroom setting stacks up favorably to the effects of medication in the classroom setting. And what about peer relationships? This is from a study that uh, Andrew Cronus published uh, several years ago. This shows ADHD children in a summer program setting and recreational interactions with other children. And this is frequency counts of their negative behaviors either with or without the intervention in place. The purple lines are when the intervention was withdrawn. The, taught, the, the high bars reflect negative behavior and show when the intervention is withdrawn. And the relatively low bars before and after those high bars show what was going on with the treatment in place before the withdrawal of the behavioral intervention and then after the behavioral intervention was reinstated. So what you can see is that for following rules, FAR, following activity rules, noncompliance, interruption, conduct problems, which is aggressive behavior, negative verbalizations primarily directed towards other children, that would be teasing, for example, and uh, complaining and whining, the effect of the intervention was huge on a, a variety of social behaviors of ADHD children in recreational settings with other children. So those three slides I showed illustrate in three different studies the effect of parent training on parent discipline, the effect of uh, a teacher-based classroom intervention on children's behavior in a classroom setting, and the effect of a behavioral intervention on children's social behavior around other children in a summer treatment program setting. I'm going to talk for just a couple of minutes about medication because uh, part of the purpose of this talk is to go over combined treatments in addition to behavioral treatments. And I've taken the position that combined treatments is what happens uh, when the behavioral treatment is insufficient and we add medication to the behavioral treatment. So we're going to talk about medication for just a minute. That implies that, that one determines the need for medication after one has started behavioral treatment. And as everyone who works with ADHD children with medication knows, uh, methylphenidate is effective for some ADHD children, amphetamine is effective for some ADHD children, and adamoxetine is effective for some ADHD children. So if a child is unresponsive to one of the psychostimulants that are approved, FDA approved, then, then the other ones can be tried. You use these at a minimal rather than a maximal effective dose. The reason for that is that, uh, is that uh, medication has dose, huge dose response effects. One gives a very high dose of medication to a child with ADHD, one will eliminate all the negative behaviors that the child shows, leaving nothing to work on with a behavioral intervention. So uh, you don't want, when you're looking at combined treatment for a child with ADHD, you don't want to use high doses of medication. You want to use relatively low doses of medication so you still have room to work on the kinds of problems the child is exhibiting, that parents can, uh, can work on, teachers can work on, and the child can work on. And I'll show you a slide about the, uh, the potential benefit from combining treatments. So one of the most important points about medication to remember is the bottom point on this slide. And that is that one of the big limitations of medication is the lack of evidence for long-term effects. Unlike behavioral treatment, where we really have very few studies, in fact, I can think of only one study that has even looked at long-term outcomes of behavioral treatment, there are many uh, studies of long-term outcome of medication, and they've all failed to show a beneficial long-term effect. So that's a real limitation of medication, which I believe is a good reason for arguing that behavioral treatment should be first-line treatment and medication should be added as an adjunctive uh, treatment. At the same time, medication does have large acute effects. Not unlike uh, the effects of uh, behavioral interventions, uh, medication decreases classroom disruption, improves teacher and parent ratings, improves rule following and compliance with adult requests and commands, increases on-task behavior and daily productivity on seat work in classroom settings. However, it does not produce long-term benefits in, in achievement for children. And it uh, produces improvements in peer interactions and improvement on a variety of laboratory tasks of cognition. So the beneficial short-term effects of medication are like the beneficial short-term effects of behavioral intervention. I show you the same slide now just to point out what the effects of medication are. So if you look at the blue line, that is in this study, that's the children who are receiving no behavioral treatment at all on placebo days, low-dose methylphenidate days, 
moderate dose methylphenidate days and high dose methylphenidate days. And as you can see, the high dose of methylphenidate uh, results in a reduction from 60 negative behaviors per 30 minutes in a classroom setting to 20 negative behaviors per 30 minutes in a classroom setting. A very large change in, uh, in kids' behavior. But note also that, that it was necessary to have a relatively high dose in order pr to produce a good change in the children. The data points to the far right labeled control shows what children without ADHD who are not medicated but in the same setting shows the behavior that they exhibited in those classroom settings. So that's where you'd like to get, down in that range. And even with a high dose of medication, we're not quite there. So medication alone uh, is very helpful in classroom settings, but also leaves room for improvement, just like behavioral treatment does. Medication is rarely sufficient to normalize ADHD children, as I just exhibited with that. It, its effects are limited to when the medication is taken. So when medication wears off, then there are no benefits remaining. And when a parent stops giving medication, there are no benefits remaining. It doesn't work for all kids. It's not going to change bad parenting practices in parents. So if a parent has bad, parent, bad parenting practices that are arguably driving long-term outcomes, we need to teach the parent better practices because medication will not change them. There's a serious problem with poor compliance in long-term use, particularly when children reach the teenage years. The vast majority of ADHD children who become teenagers, which is all ADHD children, stop taking their medication. And if you don't take medication, then it's not going to have any effect at all. So medication as, a, as an effective treatment for ADHD adolescents, so I would say medication is not an effective treatment for ADHD adolescents because the vast majority of the kids stop taking their medication and their parents can't get them to take it. If you ask parents and the teens why they're not taking their medication, they gen their most common response is to say, well, it really didn't seem to be working anymore. That's what both the teenagers say and the parents say. And the parents say, and I can't get him to take it. Point number seven is that parents are not satisfied with medication alone. I'll show you a slide about that in just a moment. And one of my concerns has long been that medication can remove the incentive for parents and teachers in schools to work on other treatments. As I've said, uh, uniform evidence for lack of benefit of long-term effects and potentially serious adverse effects on growth and substance use from long-term use of medication. So this is a slide from a part of the MTA study, which essentially looked at parent satisfaction with the treatments. There are three treatments represented here. MEDMGT stands for medication management. COMB stands for combined treatment, that is children who got medication management and behavioral intervention. And behavioral was the behavioral intervention group. The behavioral intervention in this study included all the components that I described as comprehensive behavioral intervention components, parent training, a school-based teacher consultation, a classroom intervention, and a summer treatment program focused on peer relationships. So it's a very good intensive behavioral treatment. If you look down at the bottom line, that's parents, yes, parents, would they strongly recommend the treatment that they got in their treatment arm? And the point I want to make, make to you is that twice as many parents strongly endorse the treatment if it included the behavioral treatment as opposed to medication alone. And if you look in the top line, dropout or top two lines, uh, not recommending treatment or declining and dropout of treatment occurred for 20% of the people assigned to the medication management group, 7% to the combined group, and only 5% for the behavioral treatment group. So both strong satisfaction is reduced and dropping out or not recommending treatment is increased for, uh, uh, for people who experience the medication management arm without any behavioral intervention in the study. So in summary, what are the effective uh, evidence-based treatments for ADHD? This is a slide that you've already seen. Essentially, it's parent training and school interventions, and those should always be used as the a AAP new guidelines recommend. Child intervention focused on peer relationships should be used when it's indicated. So I would uh, recommend assessing whether an ADHD child has peer problems, getting a good idea of that before embarking on some of the most intensive, some of the more intensive programs involved in uh, trying to change peer relationships because they're very complex and difficult to implement. But use it when indicated, and it needs to be more intensive rather than less intensive. Medication used when behavioral treatments are insufficient. And I'll show you an example of how often that occurs in studies. What about combined studies? So we've talked about behavioral treatments. What about when behavioral treatment isn't enough and, 
and, uh, and you need to add some more treatment or do something else. So the MTA study is the largest study of its type that looked at comparative and combined effects. It looked at the effects of an intensive behavioral treatment, the effects of an intensive medication management approach, and combined treatment, that is adding the two interventions, the behavioral and medication together, compared to a community comparison control. One of the difficulties, one of the problems in the study is that, <clears throat> um, is that since medication was so widely available, it turned out that uh, nearly 70% of the children who were assigned to the control condition those children's parents went to their pediatrician and got a prescription for medication. So the comparison condition was a community medic uh, was 70 percent community community medicated with the same medication that the other children were taking, and that complicates the interpretation of the results. But in general, what the results showed was at the end of treatment, <clears throat> all of the groups improved dramatically with time. And I have a slide following this that shows this improved dramatically with time. Uh, active medication was superior to behavioral treatment, which had been withdrawn over the course of the study. Combined treatment was better than behavioral alone, so if you added medication to the behavioral treatment, that produced a bump, but it was not better than medication alone. Medication alone was uh, prescribed at a fairly high dose, but combined treatment produced more normalization at lower doses and lower rates of increase in dose than medication that was much preferred by parents, as in the slide that I just showed you. That was at the end of treatment, after one year of treatment. Interestingly, uh, the study has followed the children for now up to eight years after they were initially uh, treated, initially diagnosed. And at follow up one year, three years, and six years later, all the groups are better than they were doing at baseline. They're all still impaired compared to children who don't have ADHD. 50% of the incremental medication benefit uh, was lost at year one, and all of it was lost by year three and stayed gone uh, for the uh, duration of the eight-year follow-up. All groups were equivalent in functional outcomes and impairment after one year, and all groups equivalent in all outcomes after three years uh, through the uh, six and eight-year follow-up. So the graph looks like this, and what it shows is that uh, apparently all of the interventions that were used with the ADHD children over the time of uh, treatment and over the follow-up in the study uh, had some degree of effectiveness, and one can't tell the difference between the groups starting at uh, year three, almost at year two, and starting at year three. So the MTA answered a lot of questions because it showed, it documented, for example, that medication works over a one-year period, which we didn't know before. It documented that intensive behavioral treatments work. It documented that combined treatment works, and it documented that uh, all of the children were improved one year and two years later after the initial study. What it didn't tell us is, uh, <clears throat> is whether we needed to be doing the interventions that were done in that study. Did we need to do intensive behavioral treatments? Did we need to do high doses of medication? How long did these need to continue? And for the combination treatment, did it need to have both the intensive behavioral treatment and the intensive medication, or could a different type of combined treatment have been done and if one study, one form of the treatment, one treatment arm had been started before another treatment arm, then would that have impacted the nature of the second treatment arm that was implemented and the ultimate outcomes? What are the best doses of treatment? We didn't examine that. And what are the implications of different doses and sequences of treatment for dosing risk benefit and risk of side effects? Now I say this because these are really important questions, the kind of questions that a primary care physician or a school personnel, who's, uh, a school staff member who's talking with a parent, or a mental health practitioner needs to know the answer to. Because they have to know this in order to tell parents what they should be considering and thinking about in their treatment. The parent, the parent and the mental health professional have to decide what treatment to do first. They have to decide what dose of treatment to do. They have to decide how long to go with it before looking at whatever else they should be doing. And then they have to decide what else they should be doing if the child is insufficiently responsive to the first-line treatment. So these are important questions, and the research literature has just started to look at questions like this. We've done one study funded by NIMH to look at this, and this is the one that was uh, represented by the slide that I've already shown you several times from the Fabiano and I et, et al. Um, study. This involved doing three different intensity levels of behavioral treatment, none low-intensity behavioral treatment, 
or high intensity behavioral treatment, and then four different doses of medication and crossing those. These children were in a, an intensive summer pre treatment program study where we could evaluate very precisely the effect of medication and the behavioral treatments. This is the same slide we've looked at earlier. This time I want you to focus on the results for the combined treatment. That would be the data points in the black and red lines looking at the difference between placebo, which is the far left, and the three different medication dosage, which is our, our 0 0.15, 0 0.3, and 0.6 milligram per kilogram. The point I'd like to make is that the functioning of the children on the very low dose of medication, 0.15 milligrams per kilogram, is far better when it's added to the behavioral treatment than when it was present alone. In fact, it had relatively small effect when it was present alone, but, uh, but reduces um, functioning to a level nearly the level of the controls to the far right when it's implemented with the behavioral treatment. And that's true whether the behavioral treatment was the intensive behavioral treatment or the less intensive behavioral treatment the treatment that approximated more what can happen in a clinical setting than in an intensive treatment setting. Further, when one doubled that dose of medication to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, or doubled it again to 0.6 milligrams per kilogram per dose, these were both all, all prescribed three times a day, one got very little incremental benefit. So what this study shows that was in, very interesting, I think, is that a low dose of behavioral treatment and a low dose of medication can combine to yield an effect that is almost as good as a high-intensity behavioral treatment, which costs more than a low-intensity behavioral treatment, and is better than a high dose of medication, which has a much higher risk of side effects in the long run, for both in the short run and in the long run. In this study, not a single child in the 0.15 milligram per kilogram condition had a single side effect reported on a single day in the study. It's very unusual not to have any side effects to stimulants. So this suggests that combined treatment, one of the major benefits of combined treatment, is to look at low doses. If you look, for example, at, uh, at the 0.3 and 0.6 milligram per kilogram data points on, on the red and the black graphs, you actually see that uh, adding behavioral treatment to medication when you're looking at high doses of the two didn't produce any incremental benefit. If you're doing a very intensive treatment, then you won't get any benefit from adding another very intensive treatment to it because the first treatment worked. So the whole issue of combining uh, medication and behavioral treatments is talking about low doses and children who are insufficiently responsive, as we'll show in a minute. Okay, so what this study showed is that both interventions produced big effects and that low doses produced clear benefit and on most measures, the combination of the lowest dose of medication and low behavior modification produced as much or as more change as the much more, much higher dose level of behavioral treatment and much higher dose level of medication. So combined treatment allowed for lower doses of medication and lower doses and therefore less expensive behavior modification. We followed this study by assigning children to go back to their regular school setting without medication and either implementing a very low dose of follow-up intervention to them in the regular school setting after the summer or not. So kids got assigned to begin on no additional treatment to or begin on behavioral intervention. The behavioral intervention was very simple. It was sending a therapist out to a school to set up a daily report card with a teacher once. That was it. And allowing parents to come in for monthly booster group parent training sessions. So parents could come in once a month over the course of the year for booster sessions, they'd all receive parent training in the summer. That was all the intervention, very simple intervention. And our question was, uh, could children who were uh, not medicated, who went back to school after the summer unmedicated, could they survive the school year without medication if they got a behavioral intervention as the follow-up? And what the results showed was um, the answer was somewhat. And it depended in large part on whether the children had a previous experience with medication. So these two lines separate the school survival curves. The survival curve tells you, shows you when a child went back on medication. When he reached the point where the teacher indicated, based on ratings, that he needed to be back on medication, that he was insufficiently responsive to the behavioral intervention that was being implemented. As you can see in the left-hand column, if children were getting 
a, a simple follow-up behavioral intervention, two-thirds of them, 67%, made it through the whole school year without going back on medication if they had not been medicated prior to the summer. The right-hand panel shows you that that number is cut in half if children had been previously medicated by their parents. No other predictor in this study worked to predict uh, a child's probability of getting, um, of getting remedicated. So no measure of severity, no measure of anything. It was simply whether he'd been medicated prior to entering the study in the summer that preceded the school year study. If you look at home survival curve, this looks at whether or not uh, children went back on medication in the home setting, and the results are similar in the sense that, uh, that uh, uh, the behavioral follow-up, that is parent group booster sessions, had an impact such that almost no parents put their children back on medication in the home setting. That's the left-hand column. And it was reduced somewhat uh, for parents who didn't get the follow-up intervention. And again, if you compare that to the right-hand panel, you see that if, if the children were previously medicated, then those rates were reduced dramatically. So what this study showed us is that, is that uh, children could be kept off medication if that's a parent's goal with a behavioral intervention, but that the probability of that, that happening was greatly affected by whether the child had been medicated previously. So we conducted another study that randomly assigned children to either get medication or get behavioral treatment and evaluated how they were doing on a regular basis. For children who were insufficient responders, that is, they showed inadequate response, they were re-randomized to either get more of the treatment with which they began, so either more medication or more behavioral treatment, or to get the other modality added into their treatment. So again, people were randomly assigned to start with medication or start with behavioral treatment. They're followed, and if the teacher indicated that they needed more treatment, then they got re-randomized to either get more intensive treatment with what they began or the other modality added in. If they were adequate responders, they just continued in that arm to get the intervention that, uh, that with which they had started. So what did the study show? By the end of the school year, 44% of the children who started with medication had been re-randomized, that is, they needed more intervention. And that means that a very low dose of medication, because this was starting with low doses of both behavioral and medication treatment. The behavioral treatment was eight sessions of parent training, group parent training, and a daily report card set up with the teacher, and that was it. The medication was 0.15 milligrams per kilogram. So 44% of the kids uh, got re-randomized if they started with that low dose of medication. Interestingly, the other 56% who started with medication uh, survived on that low dose for the rest of the school year. 64% of the kids who started with behavior modification needed more treatment. Re-randomization, that is meeting criteria for needing more treatment, was again affected by prior medication. If you were medicated prior to coming in the study, you are far more likely to be re-randomized if you're on the behavioral treatment condition as your initial assignment. Now, in studies like this, one compares as the primary outcome the two arms of treatment. So we analyzed whether People who started with behavior modification first, regardless of what happened with re-randomization, how those people fared compared to people who started with medication first. The primary outcome measure was direct observations in a classroom setting. And this graph shows uh, people who started with behavior modification versus those that started with medication. And as you can see, classroom observations revealed a better functioning in the classroom at the end of the school year for the people who began with behavioral intervention versus the people who began with medication. The same was true for teacher ratings. So an interesting question that we had here is why was that the case? So if you started with behavior modification, why did you do better than someone who started with uh, medication? Because that was the only difference between the two, the two groups was the initial was the sequence of treatments, what they were randomized with. One question we had is whether treatment uptake was impacted. Now we did the school-based intervention for everybody. So uh, one of the staff went out and set up the school-based daily report card when that was indicated. So there was not much variability in that, but we couldn't force parents to come to parent training. So one question we had is, 
maybe parents were less likely to come to parent training if they were assigned to the order medication first, parent training second if they needed more. And in fact, that's what we found. This is treatment acceptance as a function of first treatment. So if you look at the blue columns, that's the people who got assigned to behavior modification first. And this is, did they accept medication or did they accept parent training? That is, they attended at least one parent training session. And what you can see is that the blue lines don't show much difference between accepting medication and attending at least one parent training program. So almost 100% of the parents who got assigned to BMOD first went to parent training, and almost 80% of the people who got assigned to BMOD first accepted medication as their second level treatment. But the opposite was not true. So almost all the people who got assigned to med first, that is the red line, the pink line, accepted medication if they were assigned medication first, but only a small, only a fraction of them, 40% in this slide, attended at least one parent training session. If you look at whether they attended, uh, what their average atten attendance was at parent training, whether they had an acceptable minimal level of parent training, and whether they attended the parent booster sessions, the numbers were all worse. So what this analysis showed very clearly was that uh, behavioral parent, that starting with medication reduced the uptake of parent training for people uh, who were assigned to get combined treatment after they were insufficiently responsive to medication. So the sequence with which one does these interventions affects the uptake, the, the outcomes and the uptake of treatment. Behavioral then medication resulted in better outcomes in school, direct observations and teacher ratings, medication then behavioral reduced parent attendance at parent training. So reduced the likelihood of a combined intervention even being implemented when it was indicated. And that was true for uh, the parent training involved both the parents learning how to implement a daily report card as well as parents learning how to implement uh, parenting practices at home. If parents didn't come in for parent training, then they weren't backing up the daily report card and arguably it was less effective in the school setting. What the study also showed is that eight sessions of group parent training in a teacher implemented, implemented DRC was sufficient for about a third of ADHD children, but the rest of them needed more. They either needed more intensive behavioral treatment or they needed medication added into their treatment. And at the end of the school year, the children in the combined treatment conditions, um, particularly those in the behavioral treatment condition first, were functioning quite well, and that was with a low dose of behavioral treatment and a low dose of medication. So this essentially extended the findings from the acute study done in the STP classroom to a regular school setting and showed that combined low-dose intervention can be very effective. So in summary, you've already seen this slide, behavioral treatment works, lots of studies. The combined treatment also works. The beneficial effect of behavioral treatments I've already reviewed. This is the same slide as earlier. Effects in the home setting, effects in peer settings, and effects in school settings. There are uh, large to moderate, moderate to large effect sizes across a variety of areas. There's less evidence for long-term benefit. There's less evidence so far for adolescents and for young children. So what, where does this leave us in terms of implementing behavioral treatments with ADHD kids in, in, uh, in uh, mental health settings? As I said at the outset, impairment or problems in daily life functioning is the key, not uh, levels of DSM symptoms. So the focus in treatment should be on impairment and problems in daily life functioning. Treat for the settings and domains of impairment. If a child doesn't have a problem in a particular area, then don't provide an intervention for that. It's easier to understand that when you think about medication. What we mean by that is if you're considering combined uh, treatment, behavioral treatment and medication, but a parent says, I don't have any problems at home now that I've learned parent training, then don't have the child's pediatrician prescribe Concerta even if the child still has problems at school because he doesn't need a 12-hour long medication if the parents say, they have no problems at home. So think about whether you've got a problem in, in a domain before you prescribe a treatment for that domain. If a child doesn't have problems in peer settings, don't send them to an intensive summer treatment program to work on peer relationships. And then monitor the uh, problems in daily life functioning uh, in an ongoing manner to modify treatment. Depending on the child's severity, start with behavioral treatment and evidence-based academic interventions, add medication, when, uh, when parents decide that medication is what they want to add, or when resources limit more intensive behavioral treatments and the parent has made that decision. And then 
uh, dose medication low, not optimally, so you don't wipe out uh, the behaviors that you can work with with the behavioral treatment. Start treatment early in the reading disability literature. We have a great analog that we in ADHD need to think about, and that is that uh, if one doesn't in intervene for reading problems in, uh, by the end of the first grade, then the probability that one is going to be able to solve a reading problem is extremely low. ADHD children have, don't have reading problems very often, but they have very severe problems in, in, in relationships with other people. Studies have shown that ADHD kids have about, um, by the time they're five years old, have about a half a million negative, have had about a half a million negative interactions with other people. A half a million negative interactions by the time they're five. It means if we don't see a child till he's eight, he's had over a million negative interactions with other people. That's a terrible learning history. And we really need to overcome that. And the best way to do it is to try to start early. And then because we're going to have to have a chronic care model of treatment, we need to start uh, to make sure we stay in regular contact with the family even after they've done an eight-week summer, uh, an eight-week uh, treatment program like a parent training program. We have to think about chronic care models of treatment, how to collaborate between primary care physicians, mental health practitioners, and school um, personnel, and then how to make the uh, interventions that we want to do feasible and palatable for families and for schools so they'll be maintained in the long run. There are a number of instruments that you can download for free on our website, including the daily report card that we talked about earlier, and I encourage you to go look at um, the website to download those materials. Thank you for your time.